so welcome back everybody um continuation of our conversation uh that we just had some of you might be uh just joining us after not having been in that session we've just been sort of trying to digest from participants instructors observers uh local regional national international perspectives on what worked what didn't work and, and maybe as we go into this last session it's going to be about what worked enough that we actually want to think about moving forward. Um, I will start the session by again introducing myself. I am Bill Hodge. Uh, I have the pleasure of serving as the executive director of the Bob Marshall Wilderness Foundation. Um, and always always made a great point in our last session. I am coming to you from the ancestral lands of the Salish and Kootenai people. And I also have the good fortune of working in a place that also includes the ancestral lands of the Blackfeet. Um, very anxious uh, uh, for us to continue to hear from some of the voices that we heard from before. Um, any questions that you guys have about what happens after this week? Uh, Dusty was sharing the um, QR code there for how you can fill out an evaluation. I did have several comments of people who aren't doing this on a computer. Uh, being able to grab that QR code is impossible. So we've also been trying to put the links to the evaluations uh, in the chat boxes as well. Uh, but that is a good point about using QR codes in general. If you're already using your phone as the device in which you're watching this, it's very hard um, to be able to take advantage of a QR code since your phone's already in service. Um, so I'm gonna pick things up here. This has been a rather significant training event, right? This was a, a planned training event um and i'd love to hear i haven't looked at the need to pull up the roster of who's here right now so before i call on somebody who may not actually be in this session uh, but i do see who i want to call on katie bliss director of the arthur carhart interagency wilderness training center what your perspectives have been on this week if you wouldn't mind sharing with us sure thanks bill well i am incredibly impressed and want to commend all of you for First of all, the logistical challenge of this week. So <laughs> I see Dusty laughing. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of moving parts. And I think that um, the amount of um, forethought and um, uh, an advanced planning and um, logistical support throughout the, the week was tremendous. Um, and that goes such a long way for being able to create a good learning environment. Um, and then being able to extend this um, beyond just the Forest Service into other agencies and, and across the world as well. And I think it was Coulter who said it in the last session, not only um, being able to extend it beyond um, uh, your, the, the normal suspects in a local training or even a regional training, you get those uh, voices that add richness and depth to the learning. And so um, the more uh, those who are participating can um, share their perspectives, share the learning that's happening for them, share um, where there might be sticking points, um, the better the overall um, uh, uh, experience for everyone. It, it enriches it for everyone. And so I think that those, those opportunities were built in throughout the week. Um, and I'm really excited to see how this can um, potentially be an annual offering that supports those, um, uh, those uh, on-site on trainings that happen in the regions. So I know that this has been talked about um, previously, and I'm, I'm really excited for this session to see uh, what might be next uh, for the NWSI, so. Thanks, Katie, appreciate mm -hmm. that. And you're right, I'd, I'd love to see robust participation from all four agencies. I think that's something we've struggled with. A lot of these trainings tend to, one, have high participation from the Forest Service. And then also that tends to a lot of them being sort of Forest Service policy centric a little bit sometimes. And, uh, but yet even with the in-person trainings, that's, that's a cultural issue we've been fighting for a while of getting the DOI agencies as engaged as the Forest Service and us being open to making sure that we're willing to think about what curriculum looks like when when some policies are different or how they mostly probably how the agencies take a different approach to training um, and that sort of thing. So but uh, having your perspective is, is incredibly important. Obviously, running a wilderness training platform for four agencies gives you incredible insight to this. So thanks for sharing that. 
Um, yeah, we're, we're very anxious to hear from all of you all what you think about what this looks like moving forward. Probably runs a spectrum from, hey, this was a really cool thing to do during the pandemic, but we're going to go back to, to what we were doing before, uh, to, boy, we're going to do this annually and we're going to grow this thing. And I think the degrees between there that it could fall is anywhere from, I think Nick brought this up in the last session and others have brought it up. Does it have to actually be a week long training? Could it be a series of one or two day trainings that are sprinkled throughout the year that, you know, a lot of our wilderness stewardship brethren, like their field season actually starts in the fall in the Southwest as an example. So having something that more corresponds at the beginning of their season versus maybe at the end of their season. Um, but I, that now I'm starting to sound like I'm speculating. I'm curious to hear from you all. Um, where that fits. And I, I'm actually am going to start in this case with the core team uh, a little bit. Those who have know that the energy it took to put this on, uh, what we think that looks like. And, and John, I haven't heard from you yet. So I'm going to call my buddy, John Campbell. You're part of uh, a vibrant in-person Wilderness Skills Institute there in the Southeast. I'm curious what role you potentially see for this um, moving forward. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, I uh, going into the National WSI, um, I, I wondered what impacts it might have on the in-person sessions. Um, you know, I, I've been part of uh, planning the WSI in, in Region 8 for a few years now, and I was an attendee for, for several years before that from the, the work that you and, and Jimmy and the folks at ATC did. Um, and it's been such a great model and, and it provides such value to uh, the folks in Region 8 and even beyond that, I, you know, we've had other participants as well. Um, so as we as we built up the National WSI and, and saw how successful and how much interest there was, I was I was very excited and very proud of the work that we had done. Um, but then, you know, I still have my eyes set on on 2022 a little bit and getting back in person. But as we've gone through this and, um, you know, the core team has continued to talk some more and we had our regional breakout uh, last night. And I think there's a lot of interest in some kind of hybrid model that, that brings people together. They want the local in-person networking opportunities, but I also heard a couple of stories just about folks that they've met from across the country and hearing examples of what they're doing. Um, and, those really rung true to me as well. I, you know, I connected with some people that I didn't expect to in breakout rooms, um, and, and you know, offered to to follow up, and and those were great things. And I saw people that I hadn't seen in a long time, which is also a, a great part. You know, I, I talk with a lot of the same people in my job from a day to day basis, and and seeing folks I hadn't seen in a couple of years is really great, and having that interaction. So, um, I'm excited about the possibility uh, to to network. Um, to bring NWSI and the regional trainings together in some capacity. And, and I'll even say in early in 2020, Jimmy and I were trying to figure out a way to, to bring the Northern Rockies WSI and our WSI together, even for an hour, just to make those connections. And of course we, you know, neither one of those sessions happened and we didn't do it, but um, I, I think there's some great possibilities. Uh, Why still, you know, really preserving that in-person uh, experience that all of us really enjoy as well. I think you're on mute, Bill. Bill, you're on mute. I could uh, break out my own coffee mug uh, on myself here for a minute, but. Um, yeah, I think I, there's, I was sharing while I was on mute that I think there's nothing, uh, an expression I like much more than the one right now of nothing, no, none of us is as smart as all of us. Um, there's a reason why I slipped that into our opening script. I love that expression because it's very, very true. Uh, the, the hive mind is, is a powerful mind and having linking these, these regional trainings together um, uh, linking these regional trainings with uh, Washington leadership, um, I think is incredibly important. And so uh, thanks for that feedback, John. I, I think one of my big aha takeaways uh, has come from linking the two communities of practice. Uh, 
I tend to live in a wilderness silo. And, and now I feel such a deep connection to my friends at the River Management Society. And, and I actually now serve on the board of a, of a river centric organization called the Flathead Rivers Alliance, uh, which all three forks are, are designated wild and scenic rivers. Uh, uniting those two communities of practice. I don't think we intentionally put a wall between them, but we just sort of, it's kind of happened. And uh, that's one thing that uh, that I, my takeaway is, is how do we continue to move forward with this? And how do we also continue to make sure we we keep the wall broken down between those two silos? Eric, did I see your hand up? Or was that just you acknowledging? Hey, Eric, I was uh, uh, agreeing with your comment about the river management. Uh, Society folks and, and the and just the Wild and Scenic River folks, that was great. Thanks. So I've I've pinged one or two of our core team, but I'm curious from you participants, what you guys would love to see moving forward. I'm also curious about the ways that maybe you think we can hear some additional feedback that maybe this uh, this format isn't the way in which you want to provide it. Uh, whether we want to pop some of our uh, email addresses in the chat box, were there some things that we really failed at? Um, you know, were there some challenging moments about the way certain things were presented that you would love for us to hear uh, that you're just not comfortable sharing in this environment, which would make a lot of sense to me? Um, you know, Dusty or somebody, you're welcome to put my email address in there. I would love to hear from folks. Um, you know, we um, we tried, uh, and I think all of us have been trying over the over a number of years of recognizing that we have some work to do um, in our community uh, to make it more inclusive, to see our community be more diverse, um, and create equitable access to volunteer opportunities, career opportunities, training opportunities. Um, I don't, I don't think we're heading for a destination. I think we're realizing that the journey has to get um, richer uh, by doing the work more intentionally. Um, and we took some strep, steps in that direction with this training. And sometimes when you take those hard steps, you maybe take a misstep here or two. So be curious to hear if anybody also has any feedback you'd like to provide offline. So by all means, um, please provide us that. Um, um, without right now, I don't see any hands up. So I'm going to ask Dan Abbey if he would give his perspective from the core team as somebody whose job it is to provide wilderness training, working with Katie at, at the Carhartt Center, uh, what you maybe think would be a, a perspective on what do we do moving forward? Um, is, is, is this a, something we do annually? Is this something that gets broken into smaller chunks? And, and at some point, the core team is going to have to wrestle with what is the National Wilderness Skills Institute? Is it just the core team that has existed today? Is it a rotating board? Um, what's the partnership level of involvement? What's the agency level of involvement? So Dan, do you mind to respond to that real quick? Sure, so um, I remember this was early in the year, or even late last year when, when Jimmy and I had a conversation about um, this idea. And, um, you know, I, I think part of that early conversation revolved around, you know, how do we use this as a platform to leverage what's being done locally and regionally and provide, you know, resources that those local and, and regional areas might not have access to or, or, or might not be able to obtain. And I think we're only limited by our imagination as far as how we go from here. I, I think we've really demonstrated that we can pull people and not only from across the country, but um, also internationally um, into a platform that can share knowledge and share experiences. So, you know, whether it becomes something that that's uh, additive to regional stewardship institutes or even local training um, and helps supplement those trainings um, or maybe it's just you know a community of practice that's like this year these are some of the things we experienced and we want to share this so everybody's familiar with it you know I, one thing that really struck me and what we're seeing right now um, and hearing about is this tidal wave of visitor use that's going to be coming this summer all these people that want to get out on their public lands and, and enjoy them and doubling or tripling um, the numbers of reservations that are being made on places like Rec.gov. Um, 
So I, I think it's, again, the opportunity is limitless. Um, and I think for us, it's, it's almost like we're at this inflection point that we can share information and we can become even more effective land stewards because of these opportunities that we have. So um, I'm super excited about the possibilities, you know, that Carhartt National Winters Training Center is national and interagency. I would love to see um, more agencies get involved with, with this particular model. Um, I think it's possible, but um, I, I'm really pretty excited about the future. I, I, I think there's a huge amount of possibilities. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Risa, can I come to you now? Sure. Just to um, and follow up on something Dan said regarding other agencies, if we would like to have this be a multiple agency participation leadership thing, we should make sure that there are multiple multiple agencies in the leadership. You know, so if you look at who's here, it's not surprising that it was heavily Forest Service, and um. So, and that's, I think, easy. There are people who are tappable in the, those agencies. Um, and so that, I think that was a great comment. I think that um, this sounds a little too geeky, but when, when we get the survey information back, if we look at attributes, what people liked and positives and negatives, and then um, structural elements of the program, there's gonna be a nexus that's a hybrid there, I think there just will be, there'll be a nexus of what works, what are the biggest values that people, you know, that people express, and then what were the limitations that can only be done in person. But I have to share one thing that I thought was a riot, and I'm not a um, cross-cut saw person, but there was someone in my regional breakout that I, I jumped into um, another regional breakout because there are only two people in mine, and there was a fellow who had done cross-cut saws all week. And he said one of the most valuable things was the virtual format because not all of it, um, because there was a lot that he had time to think about and absorb, you know, just in his own space and to be more thoughtful than he would have heard it and been asked to practice or, or absorb in real time in person. So there's an element of that, that he really, not the whole thing again, but that he really appreciated that I don't think that I was just surprised to hear. So um, that makes things more complicated because it's not an either or, nothing is an either or. And I would just suggest that whatever we try or whoever the, the new group try, whatever the new group tries, that they view it as a step. They view it as kind of an experiment because whatever we do won't be perfect. Um, did, you say, did you say the new group? That assumes you're not a part of that group. That sounded like I just said, no, no, no. putting I, yourself I, past steps. <laughs> The evolved uh, group. Yeah, I'd be happy exactly. to be part. Of. Exactly. Um, and then just one other thing on DEI, we could do some great workshops uh, instead of talking about how much we suck, how how much how far we have to go. We can do some workshops that are evolving. There are tools that are evolving, and I think it would be great to incorporate that into this program. Yeah, that's. That's great feedback, Risa. Thank you. Um, yeah, a lot to chew on. You think about this is going to be able to live on, right? Because all of these sessions have been recorded. They're all going to be on wildernessstewardship.org with the Society for Wilderness Stewardship's website. But what gets lost when you just have to watch them after the fact is your ability to participate. Like today in the Crosscut 4 session, the robust participation is what made it great. Yes, having having Pete Duncan there as the SAW coordinator to help teach and having Dave as the regional SAW coordinator for region nine there to teach was great. But what really made it great was, was all of the resources within the student pool. And I think that's a compelling reason to keep, obviously it's what made it, that's what makes the in-person institutes and academies so great. But it's also what's made this kind of great is that we've got this larger networked community of practice for rivers and wilderness that I think is, is pretty amazing. Um, Carol, to your hand up. I just thought I saw your hand up. Carol, you're on mute, Carol. Thank you, Dusty. Um, 
just to go with what Bill just said and what Risa said, it's not either or. One of the things that I've noticed around the community of practice at the field level is this grabs some mid-level management folks from districts, forests, um, partners. Those workshops are usually really field-based and some of those managers don't get the opportunity for this kind of training. So that kind of integration, I think is something that we wanna keep. Um, I gotten a lot of notes for the appreciation of the ability for those folks that are busy to jump in and out of classes and to um, participate even though they wouldn't participate fully at a field level traditional tool session that we would have. Thanks, Carol. Hey, Louie, I see your hand up. Hi, um, I, th I want to just echo what Carol just said of trying to get, I'm kind of more on the low end of, of management and, and anything that I work with, but I would really love to see um, some more middle management and some more opportunities for breakout rooms with that like kind of breadth of experience all the way from people up in the Washington office or up at regional level down the chain. And I felt like the breakout rooms this week were really when I had some of the best conversations with people and it was really a highlight for me. So if there was a little bit more space for that in between all of the really great um, slideshows and, and really, you know, knowledgeable people that spoke this week, that would be really great for me to see in the future. Boy, that's great feedback. That's awesome. Fantastic. Thanks, Louie. You know, one of the next steps for the National Wilderness Skills Institute for sure is gonna be reporting out a summary on this uh, at this fall's National Wilderness Workshop. Um, if you all are not aware of what started out as the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance's annual conference became a partnership between the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance and the Society for Wilderness Stewardship in 20, I guess it was 2015 is the first time we did it as the National, well, we did a training together in 2014 on the 50th uh, but this um, National Wilderness Workshop as a formal partnership came together in 2015. Uh, so year six coming up and coming up this fall uh, in Roanoke, Virginia, Eric Giebelstein's hometown. Uh, we will be gathering there and, and one of the panels there will be some of the core team talking about what worked here. Um, but it's another great opportunity for this community of practice to get together. And I wonder if Randy Welsh would unmute himself and turn on his microphone and talk a little bit about the National Wilderness Workshop coming up uh, later this year. Yeah, the 2021 National Wilderness Workshop planned uh, coming up in Roanoke, Virginia and Washington, D.C., November 15th through the 19th. Um, this year, our workshop theme is Advocating for Stewardship the tips, the tools, and the practical techniques for the wilderness steward. We will be bringing the wilderness stewardship community together, um, agency, nonprofits, um, interested folks. It's two parts this year. First part is going to be in Roanoke, Virginia, with the just traditional workshop sessions, training speakers, concurrent tracks, field trips. And we're also going to be offering a special trip to Washington, D.C. Uh, for nonprofit folks to practice stewardship advocacy with uh, meetings on the Hill, some strategy sessions, agency briefings, committee meetings. We, will, we, we really want to help the nonprofit world understand the art and practice of stewardship advocacy, helping people understand the needs that the agencies have, the needs that these special areas have for um, their stewardship. So we have a, a great lineup of things planned. Um, we also, it's a great opportunity to meet other wilderness um, people. And we're planning a, a series of trainings throughout the summer to help prepare for November. Just mentioned that as part of this, our program agenda will be coming out June 4th. And we'll spell out all the details of what's gonna happen in Roanoke. But prior to Roanoke, we're planning a series of webinars to introduce this topic of stewardship advocacy and to give people the tools and techniques they need prior to coming to Roanoke and Washington in, um, in November. So you can see we'll have the details of those out through our Friday field notes um, and on our website where people can learn how to participate and register and sign up for those webinars. So it's a, a multi-month um, sequencing of events to help us prepare for a wonderful time in Roanoke and Washington, DC. I can let you know right now that 
If you do come to Roanoke, you're going to learn a lot about the Appalachian wilderness areas and what's currently going on there. We're going to have our traditional concurrent sessions in science, management, partners, um, JEDI, and campfire talks. Uh, we'll have several sessions dealing with indigenous use and practices in wilderness, um, several stewardship advocacy sessions for nonprofits, um, a whole plethora of science sessions dealing around best management practices for urban wilderness, for um, research needs in wilderness, um, and a lot of cutting edge work that stewardship groups are doing around the country will be shared. We have special guests coming, uh, Robert Rupert Cutler, um, previous Assistant Secretary for the Interior, and Ed Zonheiser are both coming to speak about wilderness and their time um, in wilderness uh, work advocacy. And uh, Senator Tim Kaine has also been invited from Virginia, who is going to be um, talking about how wilderness is nonpartisan. So it's going to be a great event. We hope that we'll see you there and look for details starting coming out June 4th. Randy, thanks for sharing that. Um, I highly <laughs> encourage uh, agency staff, um, partner staff, volunteers. I don't care who you are. There will be things on the agenda at the National Wilderness Workshop for you. Um, if you're not agency staff, I highly encourage you to join me on our trip to DC. Uh, there need to be more of us rattling some doors uh, in Congress and maybe even some doors in Yates. So um, fighting for um, funding for the agencies for these for these precious resources. So Randy, thanks for that report out and uh, looking forward to you. Pete, Pete Irvin does offer to give you a class on how to say Appalachia. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get with you on that. So thanks, Randy. Appreciate it. Uh, Jimmy, I want to come to you next. Hey, you bet. Um, and Randy made me think, um, he's already asked me what the difference between the National Wilderness Workshop and the National Wilderness Skills Institute is. And uh, I think it's something we need to think about if we are gonna continue down this path. Um, I, I hope that this is not seen as a conference or a workshop, but truly um, skills building for mostly field staff, but that is inclusive of everyone else we've spoken to. You know, it's great to have line officers and other line officers, meaning district rangers and forest supervisors learning, you know, we'll go back to shoulder to shoulder or screen to screen um, with field level staff. I think it helps us all as we move forward to do work. Um, I've been listening and taking a bunch of notes. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but, but here's a few things I think we need to think about is, you know, I don't think our agency views ourselves as a, a training agency, so to speak, right? And so my 30 year career with the Forest Service has, has had a variety of different approaches for me to get the skills needed to do the work on the ground, everything from Voyage just up to the district staff to know and pass on knowledge to regionally led sessions um, that are often dependent upon a single uh, person to invest time and energy to make sure it happens. And so I hope we're building a future here that looks more sustainable and consistent with, with this type of training. And, and I'm thinking wilderness, wild and scenic rivers, trails. Um, a lot of what we presented to this week goes on to just general recreation management as well. And just seeing the connection between, uh, hopefully this isn't just training, this is actually investing in getting the work done and, um, and getting the work done that's usually planned at maybe the um, or a supervisor level or the regional office level. This is a strong connection to implementation in my mind that we need to hang on to. Um, but what really makes us work is the grassroots kind of feel to pulling it together as well. And so um, anytime we look at formalizing things, um, we have the potential to lose that and the maybe um, 
investment and passion that some of the folks who presented this week, as well as the core team members, I think brought brought on. So um, think about that. The, the virtual connections are awesome. Um, in person um, it is is better in a lot of ways, um, but maybe we we are now because of what we're doing. Um, we might be comfortable standing in front of a room full of 50 people presenting with a camera on us also where two years ago, I don't know if we would have had that same level of comfort. And so maybe that's the blending we look at in the future. Um, keep in mind that this week, the presenters were all, most of the people who presented were field staff who raised their hand and offered to help teach something and we're learning at the same time as teaching. And so um, I, I take to heart the, the idea that um, it would have been great to see a native land acknowledgement from each presenter, but some of them may have actually just been introduced to that topic this week as well. And so, know that like there's strength in like having the field level folks present um but at the same time recognize that we're all here to learn um and then just one last thought my aha moment i'll go back to Coulter's question and hopefully other people can think about their aha moment but um i, I only think that bill hodge won the kahoot because his internet was faster than a lot of other folks you and just you just have to make excuses don't you you have to make excuses who knew that bill hodge would win the kahoot um anyway um boy we've had some fun this week and uh, the kahoot was uh one of the highlights i know for me and my family my kids uh, each played on their own computer which made my computer slower than bill's and uh so huh. yeah anyway there you have it Jimmy, there are no excuses in the winning locker room. I'm just going to say that. Uh, plus, I think we also agreed that night that I think it was Jana that actually won. Um, so, but uh, as long as I finished above you, that's all that ultimately matters. So uh, thanks for that feedback. Uh, appreciate that. Obviously, you all get a little glimpse into Jimmy and I's relationship. So, uh, yeah, I want to sort of put a point of emphasis on the the what is the NWSI, what does it look like moving forward versus like the National Wilderness Workshop? You know, we're training, whether it's field level or management level practitioners through the Skills Institute, but we only have those people to train if we have a robust, healthy and funded cadre of professionals to do that. And that is both on the agency side and the partner side. And the workshop is the intersection of that work, right? It's that intersection of, of of the practice of the work, but also the, the practice of, of how do we have healthy partners? How do we have a loud enough voice with Congress that, uh, or agency leadership that the wilderness budgets um, are there to do the work we need to do to preserve wilderness character. And so there is certainly room for both. I think they complement each other very well, whatever we decide the National Wilderness Skills, looks like, Skills Institute looks like moving forward. So have, I highly encourage you all to register for this fall. By then, hopefully it'll be a really great time for us all to get together in person. Uh, I promise you that we'll have an amazing experience for those who are willing to go to Washington, DC. I know we may not be speaking to agency staff when we say that, but for those in the partner community that wanna to go to DC, um, something that, that I have done quite a bit of fighting for our, our wilderness preservation system and it's, uh, it's it's rewarding work in its own route. It, right, it maybe isn't as fun as pulling on a crosscut saw, but it does still serve the purpose of caring for this hundred and where are we now? 119 million acre national wilderness preservation system. So, <clears throat> Nick, I see a comment. Uh, your hand up. Yeah, just quickly on that. You know, I, uh, being that this whole virtual experience is new, and for me, as you know, a first timer, I thought of everything went smoothly but um in your cross cut sections i did appreciate the pool noodle i thought that was a great alternative uh, but i do look forward to getting in the field and getting some real hands-on experience with that yeah yeah pool noodle can't kill you the tree can just remember that nick that's all we need to remind you i sure Hopefully will the pool, pool, pool noodle remind you how to function so but yeah thanks and, and uh, i can't take credit for that i think i i through osmosis learned that through dave and 
I just happen to be the one to put the pool noodle into, into practice. So thanks for that feedback, Nick. That's great. And again, welcome to our community. Uh, we've got just a few minutes left here uh, before a couple of final uh, uh, wrap up elements from Dusty. Um, anybody else? Here's your chance to raise your hand. Tell us what you thought. Tell us what you'd love to see. Um, got another hand up. It takes me a minute to find my way to whose hand is up. Stephen, I'll just say that uh, Billy Bob loses trivia points for that wildly inaccurate wilderness acreage statement um, a moment ago. Making broad generalizations, but thank you, Pete. Um, um, also, further insight into the Bill and Pete relationship. Um, you guys are getting insight into all of uh, <laughs> all of our relationships here. Uh, Stephen Wood. Um, yeah, I just wanted to <clears throat> kind of whoops. I'm hitting wrong buttons here. <laughs> um, I, I I really enjoyed the online platform. Um, I you know, and I thought it was amazingly well run. I think that's been iterated very clearly, and I just want to echo that. Uh, but I I would love to keep doing this just as it was in the future. Um, going through the week, I didn't feel that anything really had to be in person, and I was really impressed by the traditional skills especially about how well that was done and in fact many of the trainings that were the links that were given in the traditional skills were already youtube videos um so they were already online so um i i just wanted to say that i felt feel that one thing that could distinguish this between the workshop and the individual skills institutes around the country is that it's a uh, online training, uh, live in-person online training that uh, has the greater expand as a, the ability to widen the community um, through what we're seeing in front of us right now, the screen. Um, so that, that was that was my, that was really kind of my big aha moment. Thanks, Stephen. Casey. Yeah, this is um, it's not really feedback, more of just a question. I guess something that has been on my mind this week is I'm down here in the Pisgah National Forest in the southeast, and this is just a very busy time uh, up in Shining Rock Wilderness where I work. And so yeah. I know that those two weeks are the, the week mm -hmm. that we've been doing this, and we did a training last week that Shining Rock's just been getting a lot of use. Um, the dry fly season, a lot of fishermen. It's just a very busy time up there. And so moving forward, I know the WSI at the cradle is at a specific time every year but if we did something like this again maybe if we could have it at a date where it's kind of just like a lower part of the season you know not as much traffic in the wilderness um yeah just possibly a better time where we could sit behind a computer and do these trainings where it's just not so busy and wilderness rangers or other people that work out in the field aren't as needed out out in their specific wilderness area. Yeah, it's, it's probably not, it's probably not just a call for a different time of year, but a call for maybe doing it in smaller chunks around the calendar. So you don't have to, you don't have to take a whole week if you want to capture it all sort of thing. It's just something for us to think about for sure. Um, and please, uh, anybody else, if you want to um, chime in, please raise your hand. Um, and meanwhile, I just, I would say it's been a pleasure having everybody here before I hand things over to Dusty. I just want to acknowledge the core team one more time. Risa did such a great job of that this morning, but uh, it was no small amount of work. And, and from Risa always bringing a can-do attitude to Angie Furman, with, who works is also, also works with Risa at the River Management Society, bringing so many skills and was able to bring forward things that they just learned through their rendezvous uh, just a, a month or two ago, helped us maybe have our stuff together from a technology perspective um, a little bit more uh, to my my friend Carol Hennessy and, and my buddy Jimmy. Um, we kind of had some work uh, dropped in our lap at the last minute, but the three of us managed to, I think, pull off a pretty traditional, a pretty good traditional skills track. Um, Nancy, who was quietly in the background, always making sure that we were reminded of all the commitments that we'd made ourselves by being a diligent uh, note taker and participant on um, keeping us sort of moving forward. Uh, during this week, I know who has to be the most exhausted is Dusty and Jacob. Um, uh, you know, Dusty's been our uh, DJ every day. Um, 
He was really, really our DJ uh, during the uh, trivia contest, which I won fair and square and had nothing to do with internet speeds um, at all. So, you know, to Dan, Abby helping put together so many great instructors. I know I'm going to miss somebody if I, did, if I did this, but Eric, my dear, dear buddy, Eric, who even at the last minute today pinched hit for me, helped pull together um, some great courses uh, throughout the whole, it was just been a really great group to work with. So I just want to acknowledge everybody on the core team. And if I missed calling on one of you by name, it's just because it's Friday afternoon at John, three o'clock. Thank you, time. Miss John Campbell. Oh, I miss my, but John's in the pool already. I bet he's floating in the pool uh, with a pool noodle not using it to teach traditional skills, but instead just floating in the pool down there in Athens, Georgia. John, I love you, buddy. Didn't mean to leave you out. I knew I'd leave somebody out. I just didn't know it'd be you. So any final comments from anybody before I hand it to Dusty? Thank you all so much for being just incredible, incredible participants this week. It, uh, the core team did a lot of work, but you all also made it really go by being such active participants. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, 